Hello and welcome to another NERV. We're really excited to have all of you with us tonight. Um, just as quick introductions, my name is Siobhan. Oh, I've, I've skipped a slide, I'm sorry. Um, today we are celebrating Orangutan Day, uh, which is actually on the 19th of August, but we didn't have NERV last week. Um, so we just like to use this opportunity to raise awareness for a very important cause. Um, the orangutans are an endangered species. And while um, they are some of our closest relatives, we don't seem to be taking the best care of them. So yeah, to, um, this day is all about just a reminder of mindful consumption, especially palm oil that are wrecking the natural habitats. Um, but yeah, with that, I will um, introduce myself again. Apologies, my name is Siobhan. And um, Julianne is uh, my co-host. Uh, Darby will not be joining us tonight, but he is generally here as well. And the three of us make up the managing of NERV. Um, yeah, so just some announcements, some cool things that are happening. Um, if you are a student and interested in brain machine interfaces and motor control, you can apply to present a 10 minute take on a question related to these topics. Um, this is being hosted by the Sainsbury Welcome Center and the deadline is 9 September. So definitely get your applications in. However, um, sooner than that, there is the Spiking Neural Networks as Universal Function Approximators. This is an online seminar and it is um, being held to bring researchers together to present their work and discuss ways of translating these finders into a better understanding of neural circuits. So um, yeah, it's free to enter, but please do register in time um, to ensure a spot. Uh, then lastly, just uh, to highlight a, a really cool podcast, we have the Brain Inspired, po Brain Inspired Podcast, which is hosted by Paul Middlebrooks. This podcast centers around leveraging AI and neuroscience to inform each of these um, and describe how this can be helpful towards future progress. It's great if you work in either of these fields, but it's also helpful if you're in neither and want to learn more. Okay, and just some house rules before we um, get going um, and Julianne introduces our speaker. Uh, please be mindful of our different backgrounds and use respectful inclusive languages when commenting. We'd love to have your questions. So remember to post your questions in the ask a question feature. Um, we will be asking the most popular questions first, so please vote to make sure that it moves to the top of the list. If you don't have a mic, that's not a problem. Um, we can, we'll ask on your behalf. Please just add, please ask to the question so that we know you won't be coming online. Um, but we do encourage you to come online. It's, it's always exciting to, to um, meet you virtually. If your ref connection is slow, the best thing to do is to try refresh your browser. Um, alternatively, the web browser um, version of Crowdcast has an option to change the screen quality, and you can do that in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen. Okay, and with that out the way, I will hand over to Julianne, who will introduce our speaker. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm very excited this evening to introduce Amy Dolman to you all, who will be our speaker for the evening. Um, Amy is involved in clinical practice as a neuropsychologist, and she's also a PhD candidate in the Department of Psychology at the University of Cape Town under the supervision of Professor Mark Solms. Her research interests include visuospatial cognition and the application of a predictive coding theoretical framework, as has been proposed by Carl Friston. Um, she's also interested in traumatic brain injury and consciousness. And this presentation of hers this evening will be a preliminary data analysis, or sorry, presentation rather, from the case study which forms part of her PhD research. And with this, I will now hand over to Amy to um, start sharing her slides and then kick off her presentation. Thank you for the introduction. I'm sharing my slides now. There we go. Yeah, I can see them. Great. Cool. Okay, I'll get started. So, um, as I mentioned, this research is, is part of my PhD, which I'm busy um, writing up at the moment. So, some of this work is just preliminary uh, analyses and thoughts about um, theory um, and, and what we're looking at. So, um, I'm going to, uh, my patient, this uh, BS, um, 
Um, I'm going to, she's a patient with very highly unusual visual experiences. Um, and in literature, there are rare cases of patients that um, appear to see or represent from memory objects in mirror reversed form. So there are a few cases reported, most similar to um, BS is one reported by Michael McCluskey, um, and that is AH. She had developmental deficits in which she misperceived the location and orientation of objects. Um, there are other, other patients described in literature who also have mirror reversal uh, errors, such as TM, who also had a developmental deficit um, in reading and visuospatial functioning. Um, and then there are some who have acquired deficits, for example, PR, who suffered hypoxic brain damage. Um, there are other cases that have um, some aspects of the presentation that's similar to this case. So, for example, RJ, who had difficulty in discriminating between mirror reversed objects, um, despite being able to correctly recognize them. Um, and from the preliminary investigations with BS, although there are definite similarities between some of these cases, um, it became apparent that she definitely does differ in significant respects from both AH and from the other cases. So she actually first came to our knowledge um, back in 2012 when she was a first year university student. She was in a psychology lecture and uh, they were talking about prosopagnosia, which is the inability to recognize faces. Um, and she, this is a problem that she has herself. Um, and she didn't really know it was a problem until it was presented um, as a neuropsychological problem. Um, but this is sort of the, the main thing at that time that she recognized um, for herself. So she described that she relies on a verbal description um, of someone and she she know or she knows you by a specific a specific feature so she doesn't consciously choose what what this feature is um, it's just something that happens unconsciously it may be that you wear glasses or your hair's in a particular way and when she sees you she knows that that is the particular thing that she recognizes you from um, so uh, and and if that object or if that feature has to change so for example you are wearing contact lenses instead of glasses, then she might um, choose something else uh, unconsciously um, in order to recognize you. Um, and interestingly, she, she reported, so she often changes her hairstyle and she says she's had many experiences walking past the mirror, taking a glance at herself and feeling surprised that she looks in, in that way. So when she first presented, um, uh, it, it was definitely obvious that there were visuospatial problems. So one of the first tasks given to her was the ray complex figure. It's used in neuropsychological testing for um, to assess aspects of executive functioning and visuospatial memory. Um, and here she copied it almost with a complete left-right reversal, although there's one element that was um, a, a top-down reversal. Um, and this copy trial, um, her reversal error, this copy trial is done with the original drawing in front of her. So this is how she directly copied it. Um, she also showed these reversal errors on uh, immediate recall. So this is when the actual stimulus is taken away and from her memory, she has to reproduce the drawing. So um, there was a break in testing for a while, um, and then this is when the formal investigation started. So we retested um, an, on a number of the tasks that were already given to her, and one of them was the ray complex figure. Um, and this time you can see um, on the left-hand side of the screen that her copy is pretty good. There's, the, there's no sign of the reversal errors that we saw previously. Um, and this is was our first indication that um, she learns she rapidly learns compensatory strategies um, in order to overcome these problems um, and uh, after her correct copy um, she however still from her visual memory reproduced a reversed uh, mirror reversed um, image as you can see here on the right um, and 
what we also noticed is that some of her compensatory strategies is that she uses the direction or orientation of her body um, or an external stimulus in order to know how to draw um, a particular object, for example. Um, and because of the strategies that she uses, for example, she may tap her fingers on the left, uh, her, with her left or right hand, she may um, nod her head in a direction or she may lean her body. Sometimes it's quite obvious, sometimes it's very subtle ways in, um, that she uses. But because of this, um, it became obvious that we are going to need to um, administer the task in two different ways. So one was just with standard instructions and that, you know, nothing special about it just in a normal way you would you would give the task the other the other administration was we told her that she must not use her strategy so a lot of the time she does realize she's doing it sometimes not um, and i'll speak about that a little bit later um, but we as far as possible we try to do tasks with um, the two different administrations although not on the same day of course um, Right, so this is just some more examples of where she um, made mirror reversal errors. Um, so these are from the Bender Gestalt uh, visual uh, motor test. And um, you can see that in her um, recall, uh, she made mirror reversal errors. Um, and also when she copied the figures um, in the without strategies trial, um, that you can see at this grade one. Um, so when she used her strategy, so under normal um, instruction, she didn't make any reversal errors. She could copy the figures perfectly fine. But um, when not using her strategy, some were correct and um, others had the reversals. Um, and most um, of her recall um, was uh, reversed. So um, initially, before the, the actual study started, she was administered odd one out tasks. So this is when three objects, as you can see on screen, um, are presented at a time, and one is facing a different direction to the other two, and your task is obviously to pick out the one that's different, um, so the one that's odd one out. So um, when administered this task, she made a number of errors um, on, on these trials. Um, and she also, when sort of confronted with it, she, she also couldn't recognize which one was, uh, you know, when, when, when asked about it, she, she still couldn't recognize the error. Um, so these, these tasks that you see on screen, these are part of a battery that was administered to RJ um, by Turnbull and McCarthy, who um, uh, they devised these, these, these tasks, they put them together. So, um, as part of my study, I've been replicating tasks that these other re researchers have used for these cases. So um, as part of the formal testing, this whole battery of tasks was given to, to BS. Um, and when she was given these tasks again on the trials where, where there was normal administration, she was almost perfect um, in, in recognizing which one was the odd one out. Um, so when asked to, to do it with our strategies, she wasn't quite sure exactly what her strategy was, but she, she felt that um, she needs to answer very quickly. Um, so in, in the trials where, where I said she, she must pick the odd one out without using any strategies, she sort of looked at it and gave an immediate answer. Um, and here she made um, quite a few more errors. Um, than previously. So she would sort of get about 60, anywhere between 60 and 80 correct um, across all the many trials. She was much better when, um, when the odd one out was a, a, a critical feature. I don't have the picture here, but um, for example, the camel picture, um, the odd one out would have five legs instead of four. And she was pretty good at recognizing that. Um, and uh, that's when all the, the camels are presented in the same, um, the same direction. Uh, it was just the feature that differed. So she did fine with that. But um, when not using her strategies and when there wasn't a critical feature that had changed, she made quite a few more errors. Another one of these tasks um, 
that were administered to patient RJ was one that tested the knowledge of the correct upright orientation of object drawings. So in this task, there were 32 um, items that were individually placed in front of, of the, the patient in one of four cardinal orientations. So it was either placed in the upright orientation or 90 degrees clockwise, 90 degrees anti-clockwise, or at 180 degrees. Um, the patient then has to name the item, um, and then they ask to identify when the object is, how you would see it in real life. So the examiner then needs to uh, rotate the drawing um, until such time that they indicate, okay, this is how you would see it in real life. So patient RJ, um, was able to uh, recognize and name all the objects um, and he was also able to orientate all objects correctly from whichever presentation was given. So this indicated that he had accurate knowledge of upright canonical um, orientation of objects. Um, but BS's, um, her presentation on, on, on this task was quite curious. So um, in both the, the trials where that was the normal with her strategies and then the trials without the strategies she almost always was hesitant um, in choosing what was the correct orientation um, and there were very few items that she was actually confident on and um, some of the items are really everyday things um, for example the toaster or the the airplane that you can see on screen but there are many others um, but she was still very uncertain about what the correct orientation was, um, such that she often asked, once I'd gone round um, all four orientations, once she's seen all four of them, sometimes she still wasn't sure, and asked me to keep going. Um, and and she, she was really uncertain um, about that. Um, and, and those, when, when she did ask for it to be rotated, it generally was when the initial presentation was at a 90 degree angle, either clockwise or anti-clockwise. Um, and there was some hesitation, of course, for the um, 180 degrees presentation. Um, and when not using her strategy for these particular, these four items that you see on screen, um, these, this is the orientation that she said, um, this is how you would see them in real life. Um, so the vase, the toaster, the record player and the airplane. When um, I administered these tasks to, to 23 control participants, um, they weren't hesitant at all. Um, apart from a couple of them got the, the vase wrong, although the, the, the rim or the base, um, the, the top rim and the, the base is a little bit ambiguous. Um, but, uh, but apart from that, they were very confident in all their responses. Um, and it was definitely different to how um, BS found this task. So as part of our investigations into BS's disorder, um, we, she was referred for some clinical investigations, so such as a neurological examination, and she also underwent a MRI brain scan. So when you can see her, um, the slides of um, this MRI scan on the left. So we found um, that she had this, which is an anatomical variation in her occipital lobe. Um, and here we can see that the parietal um, occipital sulcus appears normal, but the lingual gyrus is not seen as a separate entity um, as it should be. And the calcarine sulcus is also discontinuous um, here and um, is interrupted by what appears to be a transverse gyrus. So this is predominantly um, seen in the, the left hemisphere. Um, it's also seen in the right, but, but somewhat less so. So with further testing, um, things seemed or begin, began to come out as, as more complex than we initially thought. So um, we did a lot of um, discussions with her and, and asking her about the different experiences she has um, and, and how she experienced the tasks that we presented to her. And she ended up describing that her mental representation of objects 
or images um, are different to how she logically knows them to be or how they should be. Um, and in her, her mental representations, in her mind's eye, um, the representations were often segmented, they were incomplete or distorted. Um, and this is another example of the rare complex figure that I showed you earlier. And this is how she drew it um, on a, a copy task. So the original figure was in view right in front of her. Um, but when she drew it, she, she was sort of looking uh, in her mind's eye at how, how it a, appeared to her um, in her inner mind. And this is how it came out. So you can see that it, it's, it's separated um, and there are reversal errors of some portions of the, the drawing. So this is her, this is examples of how, what her mental rep representation of, um, we just gave her some random words um, verbally, and we asked her to write out what her mental representation of these words um, were. So um, on the left hand side here, this is, that's the stimulus words, and this is how um, she pictured them in her head when she had to write them out. Um, the same words were given to her um, on another day. Um, and you can see that, um, in fact, that they, they are different to how she saw them before. Um, so there's spelling, um, um, well, here, this is how she knows the words. So there are two spelling errors, but um, must also be kept in mind that uh, English actually isn't her first language. Um, but normal spelling errors, nothing like how she pictures them in her head, where you can see that there's distortions. Here, she couldn't actually, she wasn't quite sure what was represented there, sort of, it was fuzzy to her. Um, and then she made um, duplications of some letters, and it was just generally distorted. Uh, this is another example of her representation of words. Um, so although she did indulge me in what I asked her to write out, so as you can see there, this is what these words look like in my head. Um, she's quite a fun participant, so she she was quite happy to to write this out for me. But um, so so here, this is what um, that sentence, how she pictures it in her head. Um, although she's quite capable of writing it out correctly, um, if she relies on how she actually knows the words to look like. So uh, some more uh, examples of very interesting things that started coming out um, during the testing. So um, you can see for the images on, on the left-hand side, the jug here and the um, giraffe. So for these, she was asked to copy the drawings without using any strategies of, her, of, of hers. Um, and uh, here she relied more on her her mental representation. So previously when she drew the, the giraffe, she could copy it correctly and she explained to us how she orientated the, the neck in relation to the corner of the page um, and the head according to the other corner of the page and she had used her body, you could see her moving around and um, drawing it like that. Um, but here she, did, she didn't do any of that, she, she tried to avoid it. Um, and she relied more on how it is represented um, in her head. So um, for the jug, you can see that, first of all, she reversed it. Um, and secondly, that she neglected the, the left half of space of, of, the, of the object. So in her mind's eye, she could see the, the holder for the jug on the right-hand side, but she couldn't she couldn't picture, she didn't see anything on the left. So it was an incomplete picture. And then for the giraffe, um, she said, well, this is exactly what she, she could picture in her mind when she was um, copying this. Um, and she, she, took, she went to great lengths to, to tell me, um, oh, we, we live in Africa, so she knows exactly what a giraffe looks like and how it's supposed to look like in real life. And, but she said that her, her mental representation uh, to her, she is seeing a, an image with a giraffe with two heads and two bodies. But um, as you can see, it's also incomplete. So it's a distorted picture, but this is kind of what, this is what she saw in her mind's eye. 
Um, and then on the right hand side, um, this is just an example of her recall of stimuli that were orientated horizontally over here, um, this figure, um, and she made horizontal and vertical reflection errors um, within the components of the figure. So here she um, she flipped that, and here she flipped that, although the, the overall uh, integrity of the, the figure remained. Um, and then this image here at the bottom, so sorry, it's a little bit small there, but that was what the original image looked like. And this was from a, a series of um, uh, uh, trials of figures that were, were presented in different um, tilted orientations. Um, and this one was at a 45 degree tilt, um, and you can see that she reflected the figure um, across the horizontal axis um, for, the, for this one. So um, I, if that's not fascinating enough, there was some more th things that came up over time um, that we systematically found on testing and also in conversation with her. So the more testing we did, the more she started recognizing the different things that she does in, in life um, and that forms part of her, of her everyday life. So obviously I'm not gonna have time to go through every single thing, um, but this is just sort of a, a little summary of some of the other things that we found on testing. So one of the things was this um, double visual fields. Um, so this was first noticed with a task where she had to close her eyes and a little block was placed either in front of her, she had her hands on a desk, sorry. I was seated across from her and she, um, she had to close her eyes and the block was placed in front of her left hand or her right hand. Um, and then she had to open her eyes and then say um, which side the, the, the block was on. Um, and then I noticed that every time uh, before she gave a response, there was a bit of a delay, which seemed a bit, which seemed unusual because, uh, you know, I'm sure you and I, if we open our eyes, we can see, immediately see which side a, a block would be on. But for her, there was a definite delay. Um, and when asking her about it, she said that um, she was waiting. She had seen two blocks and she was waiting for the correct one um, to basically emerge. Um, so she saw two, two blocks, but she emphasized that the rest of the scene, so myself included across from her, seated directly in front of her. Um, we weren't double images, it was only the, the block. So it wasn't Diplopia where, where her whole visual scene was duplicated. It was just the object of her attention, basically. Um, and, and since that time, she, she described it happening a, a couple of other times in her everyday life. Um, and it usually is when she will suddenly open her eyes or she looks, she will suddenly look at something, or when she enters an unknown room, one that is she isn't familiar with. Um, so it happens on on occasion like that, and um, the the two images eventually become one, just like it was for the blocks. Um, and then, so as part of the the battery of tasks, there's a whole bunch of reading and spelling and writing tasks. Um, and it's, it's, the interesting thing was the, the way she spelt um, words. So she could, copy, um, and she could copy words correctly without any problems. She could also write out words how she knows them to be. Um, so it's a bit like I showed you earlier with the, with the, the couple of um, items, uh, words that I showed you. So she knows how the word is supposed to be spelt and how it's, you know, one normally sees it. Um, but when asked to spell these words without um, using her strategy of, of knowing how they're supposed to be, so here she's only relying on her internal representation of it, um, she made a number of errors. So for example, she frequently made paralexia, so transposition errors. Um, and then, so the one on screen there you can see, so for mushroom, she first spelt room and then a pause and then there was, uh, then she spelt out mush. Um, and she said that uh, sometimes she will first see the right side of a word and then the left. 
Um, and then uh, other errors were that she frequently left out vowels or she added uh, the letter E at the end of words that not supposed to be there, um, or she would spell phonetically or she would make other letter sequencing errors. Um, and then in terms of uh, concrete images, so her strategy of spelling words is the same strategy she uses for reading and basically recalling all other visual information. Um, so she has these concrete memory images and associations that she uses. Um, so for example, I, I happen to have a student newspaper with me at the time of one of the testing sessions, and there was an article with the headline, um, Do Animals Make You Happy? So she used this as an example to explain to me how she goes about reading. So she said um, when, she, when she's reading that, um, so when she's reading that headline, for example, she has to think of where she heard about the word or read that word or um, she, where she learned the word, for example, animals before. So she said, well, maybe it was like in school. And she has to think about what she knows about these words that she's reading. And then she said, for example, we're happy, um, she would maybe have to associate the word to something so that she can make sense of it. Um, and even though she does these really complex mental gymnastics in order to um, read, her reading speed is completely normal. Um, and you would never guess that she's doing all of these complicated things in order to figure out what it is she's reading and to make sense of it. Um, and in fact, she was, when we were talking about this, she was quite surprised that um, this isn't how everyone else reads. Um, so this thinking back to where she saw it and where she learned it and associating it, um, she was very surprised that I didn't do that or other people don't generally do that. Um, and the other very strange thing is that when she's thinking back to where she maybe noticed something, um, she said, like, for example, she may remember that she saw a particular word on the side of a building, and then that's the kind of thing that's in her head. Um, to her, she feels like she remembers seeing it out of her left eye or her right eye. Um, she also feels that um, she remembers things to her. Um, she said that she feels she remembers it in the left side, the right side of her brain or the left side of her brain. Um, so, of course, we, she says the left and right eye. She, she's actually referring to the left and right visual fields. Um, but to her, it, it feels like she remembers seeing something out of one eye rather than the other. And she remembers um, sort of to her the memory stored in either the left or right side of her brain. So um, other tasks that were given to her were these ocular motor tasks, which are eye tracking tasks. Um, and this was done for the patient PR. Um, so this was also administered for her and these sorts of tasks, um, various things. So here's a clock example um, where she had to read the time. There were trials with normal, uh, normal looking clocks. There was ones which were mirrored, the numbers were um, mirrored or they were mirrored uh, across the, um, the clock face as you can see here. Um, so I don't have the descriptive data, that's not, uh, we haven't gone through that yet, but this is just an example of um, her gaze plot for this particular clock. So um, it corresponds to this one, which patient PR did. So the red line is his, um, the pattern of saccades that he made, and then this is the, the saccades of a control subject. So you should be able to see her, her gaze plot. The larger the circles, just the, uh, the more time um, her, her eye looked at that particular point. Um, so just sort of briefly from this data, there seems to be some patterns emerging that uh, suggest that her mirror re reversal errors are also reflected in her circadic eye movements. Um, as you can see here, so when reading that, she spends a lot of time um, uh, looking at the side of the, the clock. 
So um, as part of the replication of experiments that um, were done uh, that were originally administered to a age, um, there are there were a number of of paper and pen type tasks and, and things where she had to um, uh, grab blocks and the the block task like I described earlier was one of them. Um, and this one was a computer-based task where a X stimulus is presented on screen for one second, either at um, a left or right location to a central fixation point or uh, um, up-down location to a central fixation point. So there were 72 trials per location and uh, 288 in total. And it definitely sounds like a lot. So we, we did um, include breaks uh, just for, um, to help combat fatigue and, and um, keep her, her fresh when, when answering. So this is just some preliminary data looking at it. And so she had to, um, sorry, she had to click where she thought the X was. So we, we made a, a rather large section um, around where the X was presented um, and this captured where she, she clicked the mouse. So here there's um, a reaction time um, described for the control participants. It was 22 here. And um, this is the reaction time, the mean reaction time of, of all the trials and then the mean um, of, for the control participants themselves. And then this is the mean reaction time for BS um, over all her 288 trials. Um, and you can see for each of the locations, she was much, much quicker than the, not um, somewhat quicker than the, the control participants um, across all locations. And then um, these two lines show the percentage of her accuracy. So um, uh, this is for the controls. So uh, they were pretty much accurate. All of the, tool, the controls got the left uh, locations correct um, and the up locations. And then there was just one or two errors for, for one or two of the control participants, but they are very, very accurate. Then for BS, as you can see, when when the X was presented at either um, the up or down position, uh, she was also accurate, just like the controls. But when it was presented um, left or right, you can see that she made um, a number of errors. So only 56% correct when presented on the left and 63% correct um, out of all the trials, the 72 trials uh, for the right hand side. Um, so the with the stimulus being presented for uh, very briefly, um, she would have to rely on uh, internal representation of it, um, and and perhaps that the the more errors made for left right, um, you know, you can think about it that in in your everyday life, um, left right errors are, are more plausible um, than top down um, errors in the in the real world. All right, so this was another, uh, a very similar task. Um, so some of the tasks had different variables changed. Um, there were some with different flickers. Um, there were some with different exposure durations. Um, and this is one of the ones where we manipulated the contrast. So um, again, the Xs were presented at the four locations, um, but now they were presented at either a high contrast or low contrast. So the high contrast was a white X presented on a black background, and the low contrast was a gray X presented on the black background. Um, and again, she had to respond by moving her mouse and, and clicking where she thought that the, she saw where the X was. Um, and there were 64 trials per, per condition, and it was uh, randomized, all, all the tasks were randomized in terms of their locations. Um, and this had two blocks with these um, interspersed high and low contrast. So here she actually had relatively the same um, reaction time as the controls. Uh, they were also uh, quite a bit quicker than previously. Um, 
I know for the controls, this task was administered um, after um, one or two tasks after the, the previous task that, um, that I showed you on the previous slide. So it may be that they were just more familiar with, um, with doing it. Um, but you can see that uh, VS's reaction time is pretty much the same. Sometimes she is a bit faster, marginally faster. Um, once or twice she was a little bit slower, but generally around the same reaction time. Um, and then you can see that the controls, they were again pretty accurate um, uh, in terms of this is their percentage accuracy and they're pretty good um, across both conditions of the high and low contrast and across all four locations of the stimulus. Then um, you can see that again for uh, with when BS did this, she was um, again quite accurate. Um, yeah, 100% accurate on the high contrast for the up and down locations and pretty accurate um, on most trials for up and down. Um, but you can see again that her, her percentage, her accuracy um, across all the trials, um, she, um, so it's out of, um, out of the, the, the numbers that were um, administered, she only got 69% correct when it was um, left um, and under high contrast and exactly the same under low contrast. Um, but basically you can see that the variable of high and low cost contrast make a difference to her responses. Um, but again, she was showing a difference when the stimuli were presented at either left or right. Um, uh, much worse on those trials than when the stimulus was at the up or down location. So sort of trying to understand this, so our understanding of BS is that she is, <laughs> apologies for my dog, <laughs> she's drawing upon an internalized, subjective internalized representation of space, much like it's projected into our um, occipital cortex at the primary level. So she makes rotation errors and she has separate images basically from her, her left and right visual fields. Um, so basically her mental representation of the world is much closely tied to the anatomical representation um, uh, than, than ours is, um, those that don't have these sorts of errors. So just as a, here's a simple illustration, what you would see is that in your brain, you have a upside down and an inverted image and two such images from your visual fields. And what, what you are, what you're receiving is upside down in relation to your body orientation. But of course, you're not actually seeing this. Um, you know, when you, you're seeing the slides, you aren't seeing it um, upside down, you see it correctly orientated. Um, and these, the images from your left and right visual fields are also not initially um, integrated in the brain. And yet um, what we see is an integrated image and that's in the correct orientation. So we are obviously doing something to the image um, in order to get this integrated, correctly orientated picture. So we we creating a a unified visual scene, um, uh, even though we have access to two visual scenes in, at the cortical level, we have a, a left and and a left and a right visual field. So this is obviously something we don't often think about the fact that it's um, organized like this, and yet this isn't how you and I are seeing it. So this means that we are obviously doing something. Um, that BS isn't doing, or at least she isn't doing it as well as we do. So um, we've been also trying to um, understand this within a um, theoretical framework of predictive coding, as briefly mentioned earlier. Um, this is a framework uh, proposed by Cole Friston. So according to this theory, what you are perceiving is a projection of what you predict is there. So it's a projection, a, um, projection of your internal representation of how the, the world works. So for example, um, I predict that if I reach that far, then I will touch that object. 
So perception is therefore based um, on an active and ongoing process of hypothesis testing based on priors um, in order to confirm our predictive model of the world. Um, and so when our sensory inputs don't match our, pre um, our predictions, there is a prediction error, um, which is then minimized by updating our model of the world through conscious cognitive work. So it follows that we are then more conscious in these conditions where there is uncertainty. Um, but however, on the other side if, of the coin, um, if your sensory inputs match your inference, so on, on the diagram here in the, the higher levels, um, predicting the lower levels, then no work needs to be done. And then you're less conscious in, in these conditions where there's certainty. So just sort of looking at BS within this framework, she seems to be acting on a, um, a systematic prediction error, which among other things is reversing her spatial relationship with the world. Um, so she has these concrete sensory images which aren't reliably processed in the visual system. So all of these rules about what automatically has to be done with that information, so um, the predictions about what we do in relation to visual objects, these don't um, apply to her in the, in the same way uh, for others. So she has to use other systems um, and basically think it through for herself in a deliberate, uh, more deliberate, uh, voluntary and executive basis. So using these extensive, uh, complicated or it seems complicated compensatory mechanisms um, that are sort of at a higher executive processing level uh, way beyond the the visual modality so in a in a sense she comes to a construction of uh, um, I know that this is how it's represented in my occipital lobe so let me try and work out what is actually there I need to flip the image and combine it um, and so on. And uh, this is how I'm gonna see the world, how it actually is out there. So although not quite like using that sort of narrative to herself, she definitely does use a verbal narrative um, as one of her strategies in negotiating everyday tasks and actions, she will talk herself through it. Um, and it's these sorts of compensatory mechanisms and strategies that allows her to, um, despite all of this stuff that I showed you, that's weird and wonderful about her, her phenomena, um, despite all of that, this, um, these mechanisms do allow her to, to function very well in her everyday life and, and continue um, as one normally should. Um, so that's just, that is my research in a nutshell thus far. Um, there's obviously quite a bit more that I haven't gone into and um, still looking at the, the data that we have and, and putting it together theoretically. Um, so that is still to come. So with that, um, my presentation is now finished and I'd just like to thank those um, that are listed on the screen that have um, help this far in terms of putting it um, all together and helping with all the, the tasks and, and so on. So thanks very much. Perfect. Thank you so much, Amy. This was really, really cool. Um, so I think we'll move on to questions now. Um, and it seems like we have our first couple of questions from Siobhan. So Siobhan, over to you. <laughs> Great. Um, I'm going to actually just start off with a different question. Um, I know you briefly mentioned in the beginning um, that this particular um, person in the case study, she she would look in the mirror and notice things weren't what she expected. Um, but what I, from what I understand, this is this started as a brain abnormality. So like, how does she start to realize that things aren't normal, especially when you started explaining the predictive coding, if you're updating an internal model? You, I would assume you need some kind of model in the beginning. Um, if you don't mind just elaborating on that point. So she 
all her life, basically, she thought that other people, there was problems with everyone else. So to, to her, she's always, because it's a developmental thing, so basically it's something that she's born with and she's known her entire life. She's always had to do these ways um, of, of working things out. Um, and, uh, you know, to, to her, other people had problems it was only when it sort of came to her attention that this is not actually how things are supposed to be done that she realized um that um she you know she had the these problems so there were there were definitely indications from early on that she struggled with visual um, representations and abstract um, pictures so um, unfortunately, she chose a, a graphic design or a engineering design subject in school. Um, and she really struggled with doing the drawings, especially 3D, because she, she really struggled with abstract things. So she couldn't draw 3D pictures. She couldn't picture what, how the, the back of an object is supposed to look. Um, so it's just something that she has dealt with her, her whole life. Um, and uh, it's, it's only when sort of she, you know, it was indicated to her that this is not actually normal. She's been doing she's been doing stuff all the time, but she she didn't know that it was actually problematic. Amy, on that point, were her developmental milestones affected at all, like her reading age and things like that? No, um, <coughs> no. So she, sorry. Um, so no, she was developmentally, she was quite normal. Uh, no problems developmentally. She was an average student at school. Um, she obviously she struggled with that engineering subject, but she she was average in terms of, of, of all of that. And um, developmentally, you know, there were no problems. She reads normally. She's, she, you know, she's, since I've seen her, she's managed to, gain a university degree, she's working successfully. Um, there are some things in her work that um, that she's had to use strategies for. So she's actually an occupational therapist. And one of the things that she described to me was she, when uh, she was doing a community service, she had to make a, a glove um, for a patient in the burns unit. And usually she would just, you would trace the hand and you sew it together and it's a that's a, a glove of the gauze or whatever they use um, but to her she couldn't picture it in her head as a whole object and she actually had to do each finger separately and the palm and then sew everything back together again um, so you know there's definitely things that have come up but you know she's she's very intelligent and she's she did really well at university um, and she and she's doing pretty well in her in her daily work. Okay, it's so interesting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, so that actually then leads nicely into my um, first question, because I, I was wondering if there's a difference between 3D and 2D spe visual spatial perceptions, um, and then how this specifically affects her motor actions. Um, I thought of this question when I saw the toaster. Um, I mean, to have an upside down toaster will lead to like quite I mean, motor, like motor function and functionally to use it, it an upside down toaster is going to be quite different to a, a right side up toaster. So, um, like, how does this affect her accuracy and her motor control in, in a nutshell? Well, her, so some of the tasks that I did were actually um, were tasks where there were various objects placed on a table in front of her at different locations, so at different angles and, and distance from where she was. Um, and on all of those tasks, she was perfect. So she made no errors in reaching. So um, AH actually has uh, problems uh, uh, in terms of space. So when she had to close her eyes and then open her eyes and reach for a particular object on the left or right, um, AH would reach in the wrong direction. Um, but this is not something that we saw with, with BS. So she, she doesn't have a problem in terms of, of judging distance and um, uh, being able to accurately um, pick up objects and that sort of thing. Um, 
so re remember there's ways that she knows things to be and ways that her mind is telling her. So for example, with the toaster, she knows that a toaster is not upside down. Um, to her, in, you know, how she, how she would know it in real life um, in terms of, of that question. So she's, when I'm asking her, there's no, um, you know, she's, she's picturing it in her head. She's like, she's thinking, okay, how do I know what a toaster looks like? But remember when she's answering that, she's relying on her mental representation. But, con you know, with an object, with the concrete object, um, in front of her, she she knows that toast goes in the top, and there's a slot for the toast at the top. So there's there's always a difference between how she knows things and um, and how how she she thinks them to be in her head. And uh, this is why she she sort of she never trusts herself with with things, uh, which you know is is actually terrible in terms of of not relying you know being so uncertain in in your decisions um so she she has difficulty uh in terms of that you know in terms of having to rely on on what she what she feels them to be and how she actually knows that she describes a lot about how she she feels things and how how she in her head um and how she actually knows so she has all of this knowledge about um, about the world and, and she's got to basically sort of reconcile um, the internal representation and, and what she's confronted with. Great. Um, we have a, a request from Professor Psalms that you please <laughs> describe her experience of driving. <laughs> so um, it started out by her telling me about um, how she was learning to drive. So at that stage, um, she... Uh, the same sorts of problems were, were coming up. But like I said, she's pretty good at figuring things out and making a plan. Um, but then later on when driving by herself, it's a little bit terrifying to know, but she she can drive perfectly well, um, you know, in terms of all the motor actions and she, she can see in front of her, and she can get from A to B. Um, but uh, for example, and she said that this has happened. So on an open road, so it's um, got two lanes, um, and she's going this way. And now uh, there's no cars to show her which side they're supposed to be on. But if she thinks about, okay, there could be a car approaching, um, then to her, in her head, when she thinks about it, the car is in front of her because you know if you had to think about where a car would come towards you, it would be on the right hand side. If you driving on the left, they're coming to you on your right hand side. But her um, thinking about it, to her, the car is coming on the left and it's coming to directly towards her. And she said, when she's thought about this, she there has actually been times when she's moved over into the wrong lane because she's thinking that okay, a car could come directly towards her. Um, and she's once or twice also misjudged a, a corner, um, but she's a lot better. She doesn't drive very often. She usually doesn't drive by herself either. And she has little, little things that um, she, she uses to make sure she's on the correct side. So uh, for example, her uh, since getting married, her her wedding ring is a really good left side reminder for her. So she now uses that a lot to orientate herself. Um, but she basically has the same sorts of, of problems. Um, so that's her physically driving. She also has um, sometimes some problems integrating sensory information. So um, this has happened when she was a passenger in a car, also in a plane and train. Um, she said that she has felt her, the, the motion, she felt like she was moving backwards uh, in space when she was actually moving forwards with the whatever the vehicle was. Um, and then when she looks up and basically orientates herself to external stimuli. So she was saying that this is usually this feeling is when she's looking down or looking at her phone or something. And then she has that feeling um, of going backwards. But when she looks up and orientates herself, um, to the external world. Um, she feels like a, a shift um, that she then feels like she's going forward. So those are the, the two 
um, experiences that she has uh, when driving. Great. Um, so at, at what point would this be considered as disorder? Um, so how much functionality or, you know, can you get away without compensation um, with, uh, well, specifically thinking that if, I mean, if some people have a similar deformity, but maybe not to the same extent in the brain, um, if you have any ideas on that point. Well, we know she has, uh, she has structural pathology in her brain. Um, so there's, there's times when, when people make reversal errors for various reasons, whether it's from, whether it's uh, psychological or whether it is from um, some sort of structural lesion. Um, but so we do know that she has pathology in her brain. Um, you know, I call it a disorder just because it's not, you know, from, um, although I haven't shown you a lot of control data um, and that sort of thing, um, but the way she goes about things. And um, although obviously she's improved, for example, if I just take that very complex figure, um, it's not normal for a patient to um, copy it reversed. Um, it's not normal for them to do that even in the immediate recall or delayed recall. Um, so there's things that we can see that are different to what is typically expected. Um, and you know the, the you know on some of, of for example on the odd one out toss I found with my control participants um, a good couple of them made the odd error um, or you know a couple of errors there was one that got sort of like sixty percent but she um, the the picture wasn't really fantastic and she she thought that it was the wrong way way around but there's a certain amount of error that you'd expect in the general population. But the, the amount of errors and the way that she goes about things is not what we consider typical. Um, and she, you know, she does these things in her everyday life in order to compensate for these difficulties. Um, you know, subjectively, although she's aware of these problems, it's not really a disorder for herself because this is how she's lived her whole life. Um, you know, just taking the reading example, she can read perfectly well. She can read at normal speed. She can read without error. Um, but you know, when she explains how she goes about reading, it's really, really complicated. Um, but to her, that's just that's her normal life. So she has there's occasional difficulties that make things a little bit more more difficult. So um, you know, if she's learning a new route um, to you know, she's once said about moving from one building to the other or, or the, you know, driving thing or that sort of thing. So there is some things, but but to her, uh, she she leads practically in all intents and purposes a, a normal life. So, you know, if we, if we put it that way, you could say it's not really a disorder because it's not really causing problems. Um, but on, on the other hand, the, the evidence that we have certainly from the structural pathology seen on the scans and then just her presentation on testing is, is considered um, not to be a normal uh, visual spatial functioning um, that we'd expect. Great. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the great talk and the great question answer session. Um, it was a very interesting me. evening. Yeah, yes, I think from so there we that, can close. Yeah, I think that sounds good. Thanks again, Amy. Um, like <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Thanks for those that, that watched. <laughs> no, this was really cool. So if everyone can also just please give Amy a virtual round of applause in the comments <laughs> um, for a very interesting talk. And then, as Amy said, thank you to all of you for attending. And then the call to action button at the bottom of the screen, the green button, this evening is um, for Nerves Designer. So please go and check out some of our other work. Um, we are very happy to showcase her nerve designs here also. And as you guys can see with the cool orangutan logo we have. Um, yeah, so you can check out Tanya. Then lastly, I would also like to thank our sponsors for the evening, Stellenbosch University and the Biomedical Engineering Research Group. 
And with that, this is another Nerve Evening done. So thank you to all of you, and we will see you at our next event. Bye. <laughs> Hi.